I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we take a closer look into preparation for GDPR. For this, we speak with Proteus Cyber, Euro Exim Bank, and Adelshaw Goddard about some of these changes happening in 2018. So first up, I caught up with John Clennon and Chris Gleanslade to talk about some of the effect that GDPR is going to have on the financial services industry. Well, potentially, it's going to be uh, a very large impact. I mean, 4% of your turnover is not insignificant. Uh, and remember, that is per data breach. So potentially, it could be a very, very large uh, fines that we're talking about. Um, I think this will only be for the, uh, the most serious of offences and probably uh, multiple repeat offenders, um, not to scaremonger, but 4% of the turnover per breach is a very large impact. And I think that also when you look at banks and financial organisations, um, they have a very large, complex, many, many applications um, and many customers typically. And that, of course, leads to a lot of complexity to actually deal with GDPR inside the organisation. I think they're at the front of the queue. And uh, by that I mean there's a lot of chat about the fact that the GDPR, which is obviously uh, affects EU nationals, but, it, uh, but it's applied worldwide, talk is that Britain is going to be the country of choice when it comes to dishing out fines following Brexit. Um, and within Britain, I mean, the banking sector tends to be in the, you know, crosshairs when it comes to fines, so not good news, but I, I just think the banking industry is definitely going to have to uh, take on board GDPR. Doug McKenzie went to go and speak with Euro Exim Bank's Graham Bright to talk about the amount of focus that large and small companies alike should have on compliance. We're a relatively small organisation here and we're expending approximately 20 to 30 percent of our manpower on compliance and legal issues. Now when you expand that up to the likes of a tier one bank, we've heard of organisations again with 30 percent of their staff involved in the compliance process, which involves thousands of people. So that's the level of requirement that needs to be taking place in these very large organisations. And again, it's coming off your bottom line cost. What that means is de-risking by the large organisations, the cutting down on the number of international rep uh, relationships that they're holding, which means that they're not doing business in the same expansive way they were before, which also means that people with entrepreneurial flair are prohibited from entering certain markets. And that's why our particular organisation, whilst we are very keen to make sure we are as risk averse as possible, we offer an alternative to what is the traditional high street bank offering our type of services. Another really serious aspect of this is the amount of technology that we have to invest in. And it has to be top level technology, understanding exactly how our business operates. So we're not buying a system which provides you, which has hundreds of features which you'll never use. And that's why we've gone down the route of investing very heavily in development of our own systems specifically for this trade finance market. Helena Brown from Adelshaw Goddard had the lowdown for us on how companies should approach conflicting regulations, specifically PSD2 and GDPR. The ethos behind one is completely different to the ethos behind the other. Uh, PSD2 was written specifically for financial services, GDPR wasn't. Um, and I, I think actually it's very widely recognised by anyone working with GDPR that it's not the perfect legislation for the financial services industry. Some of the issues that financial services um, clients are having are simply not adequately addressed in GDPR. Over time, there will be guidance, there'll be you know, thinking developed and standards developed within the industry to cope with these things. At the moment, there's a real challenge because of the uncertainty um, and effectively, in some cases, having to pick which regulator you <laughs> engage with. Um, what I would say is the regulator for GDPR, the ICO, has been engaged with this and we've seen them be involved in trying to smooth out some of the issues. Uh, for example, you know, the payment system is a classic one because um, you have to actually use quite sensitive information to process a payment in some cases um, and it's not always appropriate to get consent, in fact probably not appropriate at all to get consent in a payment scenario because everything has to be instant and everything has to, has to be open. Um, so that's just one of the many examples of, of where there's a bit of a clash. Um, as I said, there, there, there will be um, 
an evolution of thinking on that and and the industry will come to uh, an agreed position but right now we're in that transition and it is very difficult. So I was interested to hear about the preparation that organisations should take to become GDPR compliant. What do you think organisations should be doing at the moment to prepare themselves both culturally and technologically for GDPR? In broad strokes, the bigger organisations will have already been looking at this for, for some time because it's a big change. Um, I would say that the, the key priorities are your, your external communications with customers, so transparency is a principle that runs right the way through GDPR um, and, and actually consumer law as well. It's all about being open and transparent about what you're doing with people's data. So that can take time, particularly with um, things like marketing and profiling and how you're using particularly sensitive data. Um, about people, things that people, you and I, would want to know um, at the moment. There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that I think people don't necessarily know. So organisations need to be prepared to be much more transparent. The requirements of GDPR are, are such that uh, you have to give much, much more information about the data you use, what purpose you use it for, how long you're keeping it, who exactly you're sharing it with, um, not just a broad brush category of people that you might share it with. Uh, so transparency, very, very fundamental principle. We are being approached by a large number of organisations who at the moment are saying we're trying to do all the data mapping, we've got Excel spreadsheets coming out of our ears, we, don't, we can't manage this, how can you help us? And that's great because we have a very straightforward approach, starting with an interview uh, of the business, understanding what data they use, why they use it and then, if it's appropriate, going down and doing the deep dive into how it's secured, how it's protected and so on. So it's a, a natural process. The thing we have to remember is GDPR is driven by consumer need and the want that we all have as individuals to have more control over how our personal information is used. Um, so in order to win and maintain business, the banks are having to adapt to new ways of working more open ways of working, um, more open ways of using personal data. Um, and the bigger banks are struggling more, I think, to, to accommodate that because in these institutions, ways of working have necessarily been developed um, and it just takes longer to make change in bigger organisations. But We're a small organisation here with our speciality being in the trade finance area. Some of the new regulations you mentioned don't apply to us today. However, what we do, we purposefully look at those regulations and see if there is a possibility in the countries that we're working in that they might be applicable at that time. So we've ramped up our legal team here and our compliance teams to make sure that we're fully cognizant of those particular changes taking place and where things are in place, if there are changes taking place, we need to look at those on a regular basis and then implement that within the software that we have as well. After hearing about some of the preparation that organisations need to take, I wanted to hear about the level that they need to reach in order to maintain compliance. The ICO has indicated that they will take into account the work that you have been doing to comply with the GDPR. So if you have the ability to demonstrate that work and demonstrate your progress against, you know, against compliance, you are likely to get a mitigation and you know, I mean, let's just, you know, take your own figure, 25%, 50% mitigation. Well, that could be 10 or 20 million pounds. So the reality is, you know, in terms of an ROI, it makes an awful lot of sense to get on and be doing something. And the, the better you can do it and the better you can demonstrate your compliance, uh, the better when it comes to uh, dealing with a problem. What areas of GDPR do you think have been overlooked slightly? I think we're seeing all the focus at the moment on the data mapping, on the early stages, which is needed to get the data repository in place to be able to produce the report. I think the back end of it is actually then dealing with breach notifications um, and dealing with uh, subject access requests. So, but, but uh, most organisations that we're talking to are not yet focusing on that. They're looking at the early parts of how we can help them. I think some of the benefits of that early work will pay off later on. What we've done also is become one of the first users in the UK of a piece of software which handles our due diligence. Within that software, there is an AI element to it. Now everybody talks about artificial intelligence taking over from the way that, or the roles that people have. What we've done is to look at the, the AI element of that so that it would do the repetitive work that an operator would have done which then gives us more time to analyze the results of that. So it's actually doing the automation 
and using the intelligence of a search that you would have done across multiple data sources, aggregating those data sources, and then we take an informed view about the responses that have come from that piece of software. And what we found from that, from the very first time we used it, we were able to signal an alert we wouldn't have found perhaps on another system or would have taken a long time to find, which then enabled us to stop the transaction. And that way we would mitigate our risk and also not do that particular transaction. We wouldn't take our fees, but it's really saved us as an organization and the buyer and the seller in that particular transaction. Because if it's gone wrong in some way and you can't trust the buyer to pay, then that's very, very useful information for the seller because their goods will be transferred and they're going to sit in a warehouse somewhere and never be paid for them and they will have charges. And from our side, it means that there won't be a legal implication to the way they're working. GDPR has been dubbed by some as an extinction level event for banks. How can you really help banks prevent and handle situations like what happened earlier in this year with Tesco Bank? So what happened to Tesco Bank was essentially a cyber, a cyber security breach. It was a hacking. It was very focused, large scale, organised crime. Um, that was successful. It exposed weaknesses in their system. I think it's been well publicised that perhaps the, the passwords and access controls for user access were not what they should have been. So I think that demonstrates that there are a lot of easy wins out there because actually to update password and access controls is, yes, technically uh, a bit of work, but the concept of that is not a particularly complex legal concept. Um, I, I would be wary of a message that GDPR is an extinction level event. I think that is um, slightly over, over egging the, the pudding. As I said earlier, I, th I think the banks already have good compliance structures in place for data protection. Certainly, it, it massively ups the ante in terms of the risk of failure. So the level of fines we're looking at now, 4% of global turnover is is vastly increased from what it was uh, or what it is at the moment, which is 500,000. Um, but you know, I certainly don't think the, 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 the aim of the regulator or of the legislation is to put banks out of business provided that they're trying to comply and that they have structures in place. Um, the regulator has been clear up until now that they will continue to have a partly uh, educator role as well as an enforcer role and that's how the regulator works at the moment and I would expect that to continue. Um, that said, Adapt or Die perhaps is fair comment for, for, for any organisations who are not really embracing the change and trying to comply. Um, but, but generally speaking, I've not come across that. You know, I've, I've come across um, uh, amongst, amongst our client base and those that I know in the industry. We have got very focused compliance programmes, um, are taking great care to make sure that the processes and policies and how they use personal data are are updated to comply with GDPR. Um, those who are not doing that will certainly find themselves perhaps uh, facing extinction as a result of a GDPR fine, but um, I, certainly from what I'm seeing, I wouldn't anticipate that being the case. I wanted to hear about how GDPR will affect the industry as a whole and what is in store for the next few years. Where do you see the financial industry heading in the next few years? I see mergers, acquisitions, a restriction of business in many areas, de-risking taking place as well, a higher incidence of cyber threats, and also a higher cost of, of being in a position to attack those threats as well. More diverse markets and very much more sophisticated criminals trying to not only hack the system, but trying to hide the identity and try to extract money by different ways, like malware, for example. So banks have got to be prepared to make huge investments, look at the resource they have in order to protect themselves in a much greater way than they had before. As they say, criminals attack where the money is. So large banks will, in particular, be suspect as far as, and, and very much targeted by those types of criminals. I think from the position where we are today, we are perhaps not the same target. But we have to be wary and we have to be very mindful of the type of attacks, the sophistication of attacks 
the type of people sitting who are purposefully attacked, nation states, for example, coming after financial institutions. But remembering our volume of traffic, our overall revenue is nowhere near that of a high street bank. We'd like it to be. That means we have to inure and guarantee that our internal processes are safe, secure, guarded, reliable and guaranteed. And if we can do that, that's, uh, I think, one area of um, great concern to us. The next one is the increased regulation and the cost which is still going to go around that. Unfortunately, markets today, when there's a blip in the market, there's a problem with a particular vendor or a particular financial institution, what comes down afterwards is very restrictive regulation that affects the whole industry. So perhaps the, the actions of one affect the actions and the provenance of many. And that's what's happening with regulation, which means everybody has to apply the same new techniques and revenue and resource expenditure to make sure you become compliant because of something that's happened in perhaps a smaller element somewhere else. So it's not just, not just the fine part that is potential, but it's also how do you go about dealing with um, subject access requests for all of your clients, for example? Um, it's a very big change for, for banks. Do you think the fines are too far? The European Union is serious, okay? They have fundamentally changed. Uh, they've turned on its head um, the rights that consumers have about their data. Um, it's no longer the organisation's data, it's the consumer's data. And I think they're serious about it. And I think the fines are designed to make sure that organisations take the handling of their customers' data more seriously because the industry does not have a good track record of, of data breaches. I mean, there were 143 million data breaches last year alone. Um, so the industry has quite a poor track record of, um, of protecting consumers' data. And um, only recently we've seen some high-profile examples of that. And I think they're serious and I think the fines will be seismic in, in, their, in their scale. I think they will send shockwaves through the industry uh, when they're applied to those multiple repeat offenders. And I think that um, that's the reason why the scale of the fines are what they are. Um, hopefully people that take GDPR seriously won't get those fines, of course. I mean, we are seeing it being done successfully and there are certainly a lot of the bigger banks engaging with new products, taking more of a risk-based view on things, um, to, to embrace new technologies that are out there to enhance customer experiences and actually you know, privacy enhancing technologies as well, um, such as using blockchain-based products mm. for security encryption. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of that demonstrated with the bigger banks too. So um, I, I certainly don't think it's as straightforward as the challenger banks will succeed and the bigger banks will fail, but they, they are at an advantage because of their size, definitely. On the next episode of FinTech Finance, we take a look at secure messaging. Thank you.